everybody. It is Mike Levin on Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. And this will be a quick one because in less than a half hour, I'll be tuning in to a live webinar being given by Rand Fishkin of SEO Moz fame. I guess nowadays Moz and nowadays whatever company he has subsequently moved on to, although I think he's still a uh, part owner of Moz. Anyhow, he has risen back into some notoriety in the spotlight recently because of an article he's written about uh, research showing that over 60% of traffic is of the zero click sort. And that was provocative enough to provoke a reaction from Google saying uh, this is out of context at best and not true at worst. And so this is the rebuttal to the rebuttal. We'll be joining in, and by we, I mean me and some of my coworkers who uh, signed up for this webinar um, to hear what he has to say. Uh, these things are of great interest uh, to me as my primary field, the field I guess I still put on my resume insofar as I uh, still keep one, is SEO, search engine optimization, because it will always get me a job. It's my experience, it's my war stories, it's my uh, most honed expertise, I guess, in all things technology. And it's always under flux, it's always changing, and there's these critical events which things really change forever from and don't come back. The rise of Google, it's, it was one of them. Uh, Google stopping giving keyword data in non-secured web searches as part of the referrer variable, the referrer part of the HTTP uh, header request when fetching web pages. So it used to say, may I have the following web page? By the way, here's how I found you, including the keywords in the search query on the occasion that I came to you by Google. And that stopped being provided in the quote, not provided event of 2013, which started out like 15% encrypted. And then it was like the frog being cooked little by little. It was all basically all search encryption, all search traffic is encrypted now and you don't get the keyword data unless you go with your hat in your hand and hit the Google Search Console API, which is what my last bunch of videos taught you how to do. Google giveth and Google taketh away. The original characteristic of the web and the HTTP protocol that allowed the spillage of such valuable data as the keywords that you searched in at the search engine that referred you to that site was sometimes called the web bug, the web bug. Why was it called the web bug? Because it was sitting there listening to you, handing on an important bit about your uh, privacy, you know. Does the website have a right to know what keywords you searched on that led them to that site? Well, what what rights do you have? I mean, uh, it happens because the get protocol of uh, search, that's really what it is, it's the, uh, sorry, I just gotta pay attention here for a moment. Get back on the highway again. Yeah, so, you know, the web bug was automatically given as almost a gift by those who controlled a generic search, being the Alta Vistas of the day, and then of course Google when it came on the scene. They're like, well, there's no reason to use the post method of doing a search, which is where all your form data is kind of uh, bundled up in the background and sent as a separate part from the please fetch the following page request of fetching a web page. There's really two ways to fetch. There's the get method, which is just like fetching a URL. There's no metadata to it. The metadata is on the URL request. It's that uh, very familiar question mark 
attribute or parameter equals arguments, ampersand parameter equals arguments, and so on until you get through all your parameters. And that is very easily parsed off of the URL, off of the request, and uh, used for different purposes by the web server receiving the request. Usually it knows where to stop the file request and where to begin the parameters and arguments, right? So that's uh, standards. Um, and that is, uh, so what was the point I was making there? So, when searches are made using the get method, because there's something like keywords equals, or search equals, or q equals, whatever the argument, the parameter uh, to that argument is, uh, found in the page request, and that's really easy to see and to read and to do stuff with, and I did. I made an application called Hittail that was around for 16 years, a web 2.0 app with a really long life. Uh, I got handed from hand to hand. It never grew and matured into anything bigger because really after I did it as work for hire, my heart wasn't into it. Uh, combination of things. Uh, it was work for hire and I never really owned as much of it as uh, I felt I, I should have. But that, it's a matter of, uh, you know, punishing yourself despite, you know, so I, there's so many different scenarios and the way things could have turned out. So the other part of that is I happened to have gotten married at about the same time. So a combination of my heart not being in it and having recently gotten married and then a kid didn't long follow, I did not advance Hittail uh, nearly as long or as far as uh, I could have. And in some know, bizarro alternative worlds, maybe you should have, but, you know, could have, should have, you got to be happy with the life you're leading, and so it's never too late. Here I am, 50 years old, right? I'm 50 years old, and I'm halfway to 51. So, I've got to stop the explore mode and start doing more of the exploit mode. It's a terrible word for it, but it's the explore-exploit algorithm. So, uh, it's at the beginning of the book, uh, Algorithms for Living. It's one of the audibles I, sh I had uh, listened to. And I don't think I even listened all the way through it because I got a lot of the points out of the early chapter, says someone who puts down people who skim and have uh, light, shallow knowledge of things. However, um, I loud and clear received the message. I am an explorer, not an exploiter. By nature, I like to explore. The journey is the reward. I read the early biography of Steve Jobs. The journey is the reward. And I'm like, yeah, the journey is the reward. However, that combined with a certain risk aversion that I had as a uh, suburbanite child of uh, likewise uh, risk adverse people, uh, except for the grandiose gestures that came at the end by my dad going off and buying a check cashing company that I had to take over when he died and ended up having to shoot a guy who was trying to rob me by hitting me over the head with a hammer. So you never know how things turn out and the grandiose gestures made by my mom on, on the other side went crazy and disappeared a couple of times forcing me to make decisions about how much of the good son I was going to be. Fool me once, shame on you. And so fool me twice and I won't get shamed again. And that's what I did. I held my grounds because uh, by the second or the third go around, I had a kid and I was like, I'm not going to let this get sabotaged. I am going to get the full enjoyment of my kid through her two-year-old and three-year-old without this dark mark of having to go there and sit by the deathbed mother as she died of breast cancer after finally reappearing, stabilizing, getting care at a hospice and a, uh, I guess it was uh, the Canuck Clubhouse, a, you know, halfway house to recovery to people and to society from all kinds of backgrounds, uh, which the Midwest tends to do a heck of a lot better than the uptight East Coast. So my mom did not do well in the system here. And so whenever she disappeared with her, you know, condition, 
she tended to reappear in the Midwest with the tree-hugging crystal uh, people, and she did a lot better out there. And those states, not all states are equal in how they uh, respect and treat and help their uh, the mentally ill. But, uh, let's see, Colorado is, is quite good. Colorado, New Mexico, I believe Arizona. She's ended up in a number of different places. And, uh, yeah, clearly the Midwest is uh, much more willing to tolerate uh, crazies. And so... I uh, kept getting uh, yanked back into parental matters, you know, uh, birth-given atomic family matters. Uh, first with issues of my dad, you know, uh, dying and me having to take care of the estate such as it was. Oh, God, I should have just walk away from that stuff. And uh, then second with my mom going on her, you know, uh, disappearing, you know, uh, wanderlust those things were. And, uh, you know, that ending through, you know, its natural uh, cycle. And then me, you know, in the midst of all that, really not having a uh, single passion except the Amiga computer from years and years ago, which had gone away and was a source of heartbreak. And then the uh, Commodore spin-offs that got created uh, as a result of that. Uh, also turning out to be heartbreaks for other reasons that woke me up to the realities of life. A sort of appreciation for misplaced love. Wow, that's a theme. If I'm writing a book out of all of this that has a little bit to do with technology, a little bit to do with life, and life experiences, uh, the uh, among the core lessons core lessons. Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. Microsoft loves all of it. I need a real snappy poem of each of this. They don't want you to learn. You know, Vim is the one that will make you multi-platform and non-Microsoft dependent one day, so it's the one they least want you using. All the others are fine. They'll, uh, if they can't buy the tool, they'll buy the community surrounding it. GitHub, uh, NPM, you know, the strategies are in full gear. So there's technology and tooling issues that are uh, central and at heart of what I talk about, core to what I talk about, where you invest your muscle memory and the ability to get better at things over the course of your life without the vendor having the ability to pull the carpet out from underneath of you. And for the free and open source projects on which you're relying instead to have enough life and momentum to survive any crisis and to have classic version freezes in case you need to go back to old stuff where your muscle memory was sharpest. So all these things uh, come with Python really, really well. And it was, ah, the language that fit. But a core lesson here is also, it's not really just Python, it's Linux, because you need a place to run your apps and a way for all your apps to be able to talk uh, to each other, you see. They, uh... Whoops. Oh, I need to correct my route and drop off for the, uh... The Rand, uh webinar coming up. So I guess I'll be wrapping up there. Who knows whether this one will actually uh, reach uh, YouTube or not. It's probably one of my most interesting ones. Oh, I'm doing it correct. Yay! Yay me! I'll keep going. I'll keep going right up to as long as I can. And speaking of muscle memory, it's so interesting that I do some of these more uh, casual videos in complete and entire uh, muscle memory mode. I just need to be able to rely on my body knowing the route to get back home. And my head has to be in the game with conscious thought when there's traffic, when I'm coming to key intersections, and, uh, you yeah, know, merges. 
At all other times, you're scanning with your peripheral vision. It's not like you're not thinking about the other tasks. It's that the other tasks do not detract from talking. That's what's going on there. And I know there will be people who don't buy into that, or like you gotta have your full mind and you gotta be fixed on the road. But that reveals a certain lack of expertise, a lack of comfort. Uh, true expertise has the thing you're doing so completely internalized that it fades into the background. So if you're an expert driver, much of it fades into the background, which is what makes it possible and all your excess cognitive capacity can go into the extraordinary, which is when things don't meet your expectations as you're scanning, 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 things are where they're supposed to be. The second something is not where it's supposed to be, your full attention snaps back to the thing which previously had been fairly well on automatic. So, we talk here about those things in technology that can benefit from long-term muscle memory and it's a continuous um, return to the timeless classics which come from the free and open source world with roots to times even long before the free and open source world where things have been black boxed, reverse engineered enough times such that implementations fully and unchallengingly belong to the free and open source world like Vim and whose uh, future is assured because there's so much interest in its survival that no one will let it die. Now, as opposed to Python that has a uh, that has a foundation behind it, with you know charters and mandates and you know um, officers and budgets and large corporate interest in ensuring the continuation and survival of Python, uh, Vim is not so blessed. Vim is the creation of Bram Mullen. Have it correct. It's a you know um, Venetian. If I got it right, Venetian. Yeah, because there's you know Dutch, which belongs you know, Lin Linux, which belongs to the Dutch. Um, Python, no Python, which belongs to the Dutch. Linux, which belongs to the uh, Netherlands. Right. I got it. Right. Linux to the Netherlands and uh, Vim to Finland. So, the Scandinavians know the tech. It's not all Scandinavia, I know some of it is uh, more Western Europe, but those, uh, you know, Europeans often referred to as Scandinavians, including the Netherlands, uh, know tech. And, uh, wow. I worked for a Norwegian company for many years, eight years of my professional career much of my core comes from before the era of the web but after the era of the internet I was on the CBM Vax I thought that was pretty badass I had a account on the Commodore Vax and I got on to the old school internet through a whole series of uh, little apps none of which were web browsers but they let you do silly little things uh, like Gopher and FTP FTP was probably the closest thing you know, because it was fetching files. It was like the files without the hypertext uh, human front end to the web. It's like, I want that file. Okay, here's the file. And the abstraction didn't take it to uh, page browsing. So page browsing combined with fetching files was the killer app that made the web. And, um, yeah, so where am I going with that? I've got about eight minutes to my webinar, so I'll, I'll wrap up real soon. Do 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 do, Swiss Army knife of SEO, pipulate. I've made old versions that have done really basic stuff and just gave you such primitives it didn't make sense to people, although I got the top of search for free and open source SEO, so I have people scratching their head saying WTF, even showing up in articles. People cross-reference the author of this Pipulate project, this Mike Levin SEO, 
from New York City with the person who co-wrote the article that comes up when you search for best SEO software. And they go, oh, he's got some clout in the industry. He made this thing called Hittail, which was around until recently. So he knows a little thing or two. However, things change and we have to be, as uh, Raymond Hedinger would say, mutable minds. So long as your mind is mutable, like a list, you can learn. If your mind is immutable, like a tuple, you may not learn. Because there's not room left over, because it's a static state, and there's already a value in that location. And so that's immutable. It only has a fixed number of locations. Each location gets set, and you can only change that value if a way is provided to change it. But if the object is immutable, by definition, it should not be changed. It's not always the case in Python. It's a little dirty story. Just like internals are not really internals. But... That's another video. Um, Python is awesome. The big blade of the Swiss Army knife is Linux. The scissors is Python because it lets you do all kinds of funky stuff. And there's little problems with scissors. It's got strong opinions. You can use it as scissors. You can kind of use it as a knife. If you're getting shrink wrap off a thing, you can slide those scissors along the shrink wrap without the cutting action. So really, the uh, scissors, oh, but they eventually break. Mm -hmm. And I uh, haven't thought about every uh, use case or optimization. So Python is an uh, opinionated scissors on the Swiss Army knife. And uh, Linux, Python, and Vim and Git are two of the other blades. I don't know. I'll figure that out later for a future video. But Pipulate is going to do the Hello World of SEO, empty out your whole Google Search Console into a local SQLite-based database. First in NoSQL mode for the fast dumping, key value pairs, where the values might be 5,000 rows embedded into that value. So there's further data transforms to get stuff into column mode, tabular mode, row and column. And uh, then you'll be able to use things like pandas for data manipulations, and we'll be able to keep it, you know, dump it back into SQLite. We'll just sort of flip-flop it, pivot it from NoSQL to SQL, and have our rows and columns, and then be able to use free and open source tools like Dataset to just connect to it and explore our data and do some visualizations with libraries and stuff. So anyway, I got five minutes now where I'll have to fiddle around with the software to uh, to be on this uh, webinar. Hopefully it's uh, one of the easiest things are these days. And uh, yeah, this will probably be a nice uh, video. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. Don't forget to check out um, github.com slash Mclevin, M-I-K-L-E-V-I-N. I know it's a different pronunciation, but when it's Mick, if I say Mclovin, you're going to think super bad. Maybe that's good. Maybe that's super good. So visit github.com, McLovin, M-I-K-L-E-V-I-N. Follow my repos, and you'll see a little magic take place as I do in the SEO industry. Uh, what I've always been doing, but behind much more closed doors uh, in the past um, as work for hire. Now I'll be just taking some of my prior art that I've always had from over the years, applying it to my uh, favorite, most modern, you know, use of the API tricks in Python, automating it under Linux, taking notebooks and putting them as .py files under uh, systemd daemons, uh, running on Linux so that you can schedule them and everything. And that's all coming up, and that's it. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. Don't forget to subscribe.